Hello, everybody. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. It's Wednesday again. Uh, my name is uh, Martin Lovers. I'm Chief Trend Watcher of Supply Chain Media. Uh, you might also know me as editor in chief of uh, the Supply Chain Movement Quarterly and website. I will be the moderator of this afternoon. We will have a, a great hour uh, talking about demand sensing. And we have a, a customer case, uh, Henkel, also live in the audience uh, or in the, as expert. So welcome. So uh, you see me on the left, Martin Lovers, uh, Chief Tent Watcher. I will be the, the moderator. Um, in the middle, you see Jordan Respin, Head of International Planning Steering at Henkel, Bonnie and Home Care. Uh, hi there, Jordan. Hi. Hi, Martin. Great to be here. And next, uh, we have an, also another great expert with a lot of experience, Robert Byrne uh, from uh, E2Open. Hi there, Robert. Hello, Martin. Hello, everyone. Pleased to be here. All right. So um, to explain, uh, this webinar will be recorded and the uh, presentation will be made available as a PDF uh, uh, later uh, within 48 hours. Uh, all the uh, attendees are on mute, but there will be a Q&A at the end. Uh, but feel free to uh, start ask questions right away. So you see uh, uh, the question mark on the right hand side. So you can uh, uh, ask questions. And um, even you can vote on questions. So if there, there, if there are a lot of questions, uh, you know, you can promote a, a question, I would say. And if it's in line what we are discussing with uh, Jordan and Robert, I will uh, ask these questions uh, right away. So we we'll keep it uh, very interactive. So um, we will talk about uh, demand sensing. And um, first, uh, Robert, um, no, could you explain something about demand sensing? Uh, you have done a survey uh, uh, recently, and could you explain something about the results? Absolutely. So um, I think as, as probably most of you know, demand planning um, gives you sort of assumes history repeats itself and gives you kind of a smooth version of history. That works fine most of the time, but there's times when it doesn't like this past year. So demand sensing is a way um, to reduce forecast error. We did a little survey on what people are using. Of course, most people have some kind of demand planning system. Everybody would like more accurate forecasts. And there has been a lot of disruption this year. So I don't think we're, we're really breaking any new ground on this survey. Um, but things have gotten significantly less accurate in the past year with 86% of the people saying either less accurate or much less accurate. Uh, largest software as a service. Um, supply chain company. We have uh, more than uh, 200,000 trading partners on our network, which gives us access to a lot of very rich uh, data around logistics and so on. And we have a broad suite of supply chain solutions. Today, we'll be talking primarily around about demand sensing. And obviously, Henkel is, is one of our demand sensing customers. So they'll be giving you the, uh, the real scoop in a little bit. Yeah, but and if you look at the picture, you know um, what's uh, differentiating uh, it to open from from others. You're also connecting to all kind of companies, so it's not only internally uh, uh, within a company that you are uh, have applications, but also across company, isn't it so? All the way back, for example, with Dell, we go seven layers deep into their suppliers, 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 supply chain. So it's a it's a platform for collaboration. Uh, everyone gets the same view of what's going on. The data is all there, um, and then we've you know we brought a number of intelligent applications along to help the companies uh, work with that data. Okay. And uh, could you tell me uh, a bit more what kind of customers E2 Open has? Yes, generally speaking, uh, Fortune 1000 manufacturing companies across really a very broad range of industries, industrial, high tech, a lot of consumer. Um, we do have some transportation and of course, uh, aerospace and defense, uh, quite, quite a lot of companies, mostly manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I was actually running the company that introduced demand sensing back in 2002. So the idea behind demand sensing is, you know, most of the, what, what you have in demand planning is mostly a moving average and some seasonal adjustment. 
there's not really a reflection of what's happening right now in the supply chain or what just happened. And by demand sensing is a way to balance current information, for example, channel inventories, EPOS, weather, uh, whatever you like, um, with that historical view. So it's a way to sort of refine the forecast uh, and, and it models, um, rather than being a time series model, it really models how your customers behave. So what drives them to order from you? Is it their inventory levels? Is it their sales? What have they ordered recently? What does that mean about what they'll order next? Um, so it's um, bringing in all of your demand signals using artificial intelligence to sort of chew through them and then predicting what your customers will do. So it's, it's more than just the statistical forecasting uh, with a, a year of history uh, as such. Yes, I think it's it's probably the first supply chain application where we're actually publishing results and you're executing against them and no one is reviewing them. Oh. Man is running every evening, producing a forecast, and which typically goes right to supply planning and is executed against uh, without anyone looking at it. I mean, I've been a demand planning manager that does sound a little crazy if you're familiar with demand planning that you would mm -hmm. forecast that isn't reviewed. Um, so we have to be very good, obviously, to make that work. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, briefly uh, AI. Uh, could you explain more about that? Yeah, of course, AI is a very common buzzword in the software industry these days. And I thought I'd talk about two of the kinds that we're using. So supervised learning is one set of um, AI techniques. Uh, a good example outside supply chain would be, you know, you give the computer a thousand x-rays, some have lung cancer, some don't. The computer learns to identify lung cancer without actually you having to tell it what, you know, an infected lung looks like, right? So that's a very simple problem to solve. It's pretty much black or white. Do you or do you not have lung cancer? Um, we use it for forecasting. So you have a lot of information potentially in your supply chain, your customer's inventory levels, your customer's point of sale data. They may generate a forecast for you. Um, you have your own recent shipments, your own demand plan, you have orders. All of these have to be, these are all demand signals. They're all predictive to a greater or lesser degree and they all need to be combined some way. So you could, for example, give the chart to your demand planner and say, okay, here's the information, what's my forecast? but this is the kind of problem a computer solves for you very effectively. And the answers can be different depending on your industry, depending on your item, depending on your customers, and also depending on how far out you're looking into the future. So our models are specific, not only to day of the week, but also distance into the future. So you have quite a lot of models that are actually active. They get crunched through um, every evening, they get tuned every week. And we're using supervised learning because we know historically what the right answer was for the forecast, what actually sold. And so you're training the tool to predict what's sold based on all these different influences. If you look at the graph, you see different kind of lines, uh, so warehouse withdrawal. So how many kind of signals do you usually have with supervised learning in the demand sensing? Um, you know, it varies. I would say probably eight to 10, although we've had some customers um, Amazon, for example, makes a lot more data available, like revenues and pricing. You might have 20 or 30 different inputs. And you'll see that it really vary. Like, for example, what's predictive for something like diapers, maybe warehouse inf level information. They're a very fast moving, high volume item. When you get to something like cosmetics, point of sale and store inventory, because you have 100 shades of lipstick, they're not all bought equally. So, what's driving the reorders are which shades are selling, right? So it's it's hard to tell in advance, but the engine figures all that out for you. And uh, what about uh, unsupervised learning? So we do use unsupervised learning as well. A non-supply chain example would be, let's say you wanted to categorize recipes. Um, you can imagine a number of different dimensions. You might have bland to spicy, you might have salty to not salty, you might have um, sweet to sour, all the recipes would fall into all of those dimensions somewhere along them. So unsupervised learning we're using for new products. You have a new product. Now, what do you, you don't know nothing about it. You do know a few things. You know which customers are buying it. You know which product family it's in. You have some expectation about what your sales will be. So the tool will use that to 
to group items to find a group that is similar to the new product. It is probably ordered on the same invoices going to the same customers and then cre create a pseudo item, which it can then use assuming the behavior for that item is similar to other items. You generally get your forecast improvement by about the second week something's on sale. All right. Um, yeah. You just don't know how many clusters, for example, there should be, right? You have to let the, so it's unsupervised and we don't know the answer to what should be clustered together or how many of their clusters there ought to be. No, but I can imagine with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Fortune 500 companies who are big, you might have a lot of clusters or how many clusters would you in general see in this kind of uh, environment? Uh, yeah, it's a lot. I mean, it depends on the, the breadth of their product offerings. So if you look at a company like Unilever, there's going to be tons because you're going from food to personal care. Um, if you look at a company that's more focused, you know, maybe uh, mostly paper products, you're, you're still going to have some, um, but not as many. Would it make sense in the case of Unilever to, to take the whole company or would you rather focus on a vertical uh, di the division? Um, no, so you do the whole company because the engine was, was, is really going to sort out. Okay. Uh, it's automatically going to sort some of that stuff out by understanding that these are in different product families. So you don't, you don't have to do that separation. It'll do it for you. And maybe, you know, you need uh, uh, data from another division because there are similarities of some sort. It's possible. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, and, and if you look back at last year, so can you tell me uh, if you look at uh, the orders and shipments of large years, what, what happened last year and how does it relate to demand uh, planning and sensing? Well, obviously it was a very bad year for uh, traditional and planning systems. What you see here, this is a timeline, this is all European data for consumer products companies. Um, black line is what actually shipped, the orange line is total orders. And you can see in general, of course, shipments and orders are fairly similar. Um, but last spring there, you got quite a gap there in between orders and shipments. So this is essentially a service issue, right? More is being ordered than is being shipped. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a bit of recovery, but it's still obviously ongoing service issues uh, through the late summer. And if you go related to the SKUs, what do you see then? So consumer products, generally speaking, about a third of the items are new every year. Yep. Um, and so there's, there's quite a lot of innovation. And generally speaking, of course, people are introducing more items than they're discontinuing. Uh, that did not happen this past year. So the orange line there is new item introductions. And you can see once the pandemic hit, people really drew back on those. Whereas the black line is the discontinued items and, you know, they've been fairly steady and then people really just decided to, to cut items. Um, we have seen examples too where people discontinued a lot of items and then sort of reintroduced them. Um, overall, there's about a 15% drop in items for sale, uh, which is, is pretty significant. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, Unilever announced last year they had cut 60% uh, uh, of their uh, SKUs, 6.0, that's a lot, but basically uh, at start, I think they had cut down SKUs to make sure that they are producing, well, the right one, the necessary one, you know, uh, the, the more well-known products and not the, 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 the different kind of flavors. Is it also here uh, uh, um, to be seen? Yeah, a lot of it was about man maximizing manufacturing capacity. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you're producing toilet paper, paper towels, cleaning products. Um, even though, you know, I like to joke about toilet paper consumption overall, of course, it's quite flat. I used yeah. to toilet paper. Um, but, you know, there's a shift from commercial brands to retail consumer brands. Um, you saw huge spikes in things like, you know, bleach and so on. So a lot of people simplified the product offerings really to maximize throughput on the uh, on the factories. And what was uh, the effect on demand planning? <laughs> so Europe actually did better than North America. So this is item warehouse week air. It did obviously jump quite a bit when the borders were closed uh, up at you know at its peak about twenty six percent higher. Uh, 
but it is almost back to normal. In the U.S., that is not true. It's actually worse during the recovery period than it was during the pandemic. Um, I think mostly because people were very optimistic about demand coming back and it didn't happen. Uh, it turned out people were doing more stockpiling and less consumption than was expected, I think. So quite a challenging, uh, quite a challenging year from a forecasting perspective. You know, I had a conversation with uh, Laura Cecil uh, last week. She's from Supplies and Insight, and she has also done studies about the pandemic uh, in in US versus uh, uh, Europe. And she said, you know, what you said, you know, uh, European companies were more well prepared because yeah, Europe already consists of different uh, uh, countries with different cultures and different kind of uh, you know well, uh, shutdowns, lockdowns, whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, the U.S. companies weren't prepared for that because, you know, normally they would see uh, USA as one country. But uh, so they weren't prepared of local lockdowns and uh, changing the months uh, locally and that kind of stuff. Can you relate, relate to that? Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Um, and, and how could or did uh, demand sensing help in all this? Uh, so demand sensing... Well, of course, was doing a pretty good job pre-pandemic. This is it. Uh, it did take a little bit of a hit on accuracy during the lockdowns when the borders are closed. Um, but then, as it started learning about the new patterns, you know, it pretty much improved to where it had been before. Uh, so, of course, it's not that it has seen pandemics historically. It's really just looking at what, how customers are behaving, it's tweaking its models as it, as it understands how uh, we saw both order frequency and order size change for the, the customers in our survey. Um, and then it's, uh, you know, it's more or less back to normal. Okay. All right. Um, thanks for now. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we have questions later, but um, I would like to, uh, uh, to welcome uh, Jordan. Um, so Jordan, um, welcome. Uh, now we get to to the Henkel case, um, and would like uh, to ask you to to, to start. And uh, first, uh, we have an agenda here, but uh, you now first uh, explain a bit about uh, about Henkel, uh, about your company, Jordan. Yeah, yeah. Let let me tell you first something about Henkel as a company. So Henkel is a Germany-based multinational company. We have our headquarters in in Düsseldorf for the business and for the supply chain in in Amsterdam. And you see here on the slide some of the key figures that characterize us as a company. And I will just pick out a few. So we make a turnover uh, slightly above 20 billion uh, euro. Uh, we operate our business with um, 52,000. Employees worldwide, and we make our business with uh, 143 years of success behind our brands and technologies. Uh, but maybe an interesting point also here in this audience is that Henkel is also a leader in sustainability, and we have actually uh, recently updated uh, our ambition here uh, to become a climate positive company uh, by 2040. And I think a good planning uh, also contributes uh, to this piece. All right. Um, and I know that uh, Henkel consists of three divisions, so maybe you can explain a bit more about that. Indeed. So we have a well-diversified portfolio across uh, three strategic business units. Approximately 50% of our sales is realized by our colleagues in the adhesives technology business. So they deliver all kinds of sealants and surface technology solutions to various in industries. And you see a picture of the... Um, aerospace industry but they are active um, across the globe in in many different areas and then the second pillar of our business is the cpg space where we are active in the home and personal care with our beauty care division and the laundry and home care division uh, beauty care is also a professional hair business uh, activity uh, and i am myself uh, working in the laundry division and i know that he also are producing patex so we have both adhesives for the automotive, uh, B2B, but also uh, uh, adhesives for the business to consumer market. So that's, yeah, uh, do it yourself and then indeed as well uh, a little bit uh, in, in retail. And, uh, you know, we just uh, discussed about uh, Unilever. Are you also looking uh, at the demand signals from your other divisions or, or, or don't you? No, not, not at this stage. Okay, all right. All right, let's talk about demand sensing uh, at the long and home care uh, division. 
Yeah. So let's say first part in the agenda is, is looking to uh, why we have adopted demand sensing. So I give you a little bit of background and then we go in the in the second part more to what has happened uh, during, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, last year and especially which insights we have uh, generated from that. And then I will end uh, the presentation going a little bit deeper into our learnings around change management. So first, you know, what is the real challenge uh, in demand planning? Well, so actually, and I think this picture, I, I borrowed that uh, actually from uh, a vendor uh, active in next-gen uh, planning uh, capabilities. And for me, it says it all, because mm -hmm. basically in this picture, you see that the future is often very different than the past. And that means that traditional planning systems, which are based on statistical models uh, using corrected sales history, will by definition uh not uh, deliver the desired result uh, so you will definitely achieve something with that but if you want to reach superior results you need to look to many more uh, demand drivers that are influencing uh, your sales uh, so that is a starting point so, so uh, first question you know uh, to you now what is your personal background uh, uh, you know what did you study did you study operation research or that kind of stuff well, I, uh, I studied um, supply chain management and especially in relationship uh, to how, let's say, companies are not, um, let's say, competing individually, but with their entire network uh, of suppliers and uh, all kind of partners that are together in an ecosystem. But we were trained in demand planning in your uh, university yeah, days? I started in demand planning. So let's say my heart is uh, still very much in, in demand planning. I'm, I'm passionate about uh, this topic, yes. Okay, right. So, um, so but, but what is driving demand in uh, your company, in your division? Well, I think in the, in, 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 the, in the following picture you see, uh, and that can be universally applied to, to many companies, and of course not all those influencing factors uh, are um, relevant to, to your business. In our business, when I talk about the CPG space, it's especially about NPIs, new product introductions, uh, with, with all the innovations we bring to the market to uh, generate additional sales, and it's about promotions, building traffic in the store. So if you want to build an accurate forecast, you need to um, collect information around that. And with today's technology, cloud computing, together with AI and machine learning, on, on which Robert elaborated a little bit more in, in, in the theoretical aspect, uh, it is possible to collect, cleanse, and use that information. And that information today is often already available within the company. Uh, it's just uh, sitting in, in, in Excel sheets and uh, is not finding the way to the demand planner or the demand planner does not have the tool support in order to, let's say, leverage that in building his or her forecast. So it's about identifying these uh, leading indicators of demand and then to use the technology uh, in order to, to boost the accuracy of your forecast. So, so how many SKUs does your division have and how many uh, product introductions? Or what is the percentage of product introduction every year? In terms of uh, product introduction every year, I will give, let's say, an uh, average number. It's 30 to 40% of our business is, is coming from innovations. That means of products that have been introduced into the market less than uh, 12 months ago. And mm -hmm. so we have a high, uh, let's say, rotation of, of SKUs uh, and, and especially also with the promotional part of our business at the life cycle of an average SKU is around uh, three to four months. And so that is also one of the complexities uh, that our um, demand planners have to manage. I think globally, if you take everything, then uh, it's around 10,000 SKUs. Mm, wow. Um, you see here purple uh, uh, leading indicators. Do you have also a priority or, or a, a weighting system of uh, these uh, leading indicators? So it, today we are not using all of them, um, but let's say point of sales data is uh, something which we put uh, on top of orders and shipments uh, and, and of course all kind of master data into the uh, current uh, short-term demand sensing solution. We, we are looking to further expand that um and and to explore uh, more data so we are also working together with with the colleagues from sales uh, to to see what kind of information is available also on competition uh, because a lot of um influence also comes from what the competition is doing uh, before the week that you are in in promotion or uh, the listings at the, at a certain customer that uh, influences of course your your sell out yeah. Could, could you tell me something about the maturity of your planning or the status of demand planning at, at Henkel? 
Yeah, so we made that uh, assessment uh, back in 2018. So there is a small mistake on, on the chart. Today should be 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, we, we have uh, implemented globally uh, APO as a, as a demand planning uh, solution. Uh, and we are using statistical uh, methods and we are doing some demand segmentation. So it's not uh, anymore the crystal ball that is used, but to be honest, still a lot of planning was done in, in Excel sheets uh, and then finally fed into APO. And we believe that the technology is out there uh, today and, and, and that uh, if you, let's say, uh, leverage those leading indicators of demand that you can really make a step change in accuracy. That is one element. The second element, why we uh, partnered with Ito Open uh, on uh, implementing a demand sensing solution is that even in the more mature markets, we saw that when we reach an accuracy of 65, 70%, that is on a monthly level. But that is not the accuracy with which the supply planner is deciding uh, on the production schedule. So if you break that down to a weekly uh, item uh, accuracy, then that goes uh, significantly down, down. And if you even look at it on the distribution center level, then we reach levels below 30% uh, at that stage. And it's especially here where demand sensing can make a step change and boost that accuracy at a more granular level. And with that, optimizing the input into supply planning to take better decisions and to run your business with the same or higher service levels uh, at significant lower stocks. I do see that there is a need for more focused demand segmentation and differentiation. You know, you know, one supply chain doesn't fit all. So, uh, what did you do about segmentation and differentiation in planning? Yeah. So, so basically, on a customer-driven planning. Uh, at the end of the day, we do our business with the customer. So that is, let's say, a, a direction in which we want to go. Uh, I believe that to build a, a strong uh, forecast, you need uh, to have an holistic approach and also look to, to other aspects. And, and I come uh, back on that uh, in, in a minute. Yeah. But do you already have in your planning for the longer term uh, using more data, big data for a more advancement in planning, I see? No, no, but that is part of our roadmap. Yeah, right, of course, but you yeah, already have it uh, on your roadmap. Some companies yes. don't have, <laughs> have yeah. it uh, already uh, figured out what to do with it. Uh, could you explain a bit, you know, the different levels of, of, of sales forecasting and planning, what you call in the end-to-end -end, uh, process? Yes, I think that's uh, also important to, to clarify yeah? because often when, when we talk about demand sensing, then, then people uh, think that it is replacing demand planning. That is not the case. It comes on top of your demand planning and it is you can basically see it as an uh, accuracy booster in simple words. So what I've um, shown here on, on the slide is basically on the top, the end-to-end -end, uh, process, starting with the input coming from the business until finally the customer delivery. And now we are zooming in into what I call a three-step forecasting process. And we are currently building plans and roadmaps in each of that area. I will focus uh, in the rest of the presentation on the demand sensing piece, but let me also elaborate a little bit on, on the first two points. So one is the input coming from marketing and, and sales. And here you see a lot of Excel sheets. So still a lot of uh, planning is done in, in Excel and shared through email, uh, but there is a lot of information to uh, be considered uh, coming from the NPIs and, and the plans on the innovations, but also the promotions, the distribution in which uh, shelves we are present. Um, but also competitor data and market shares can be, uh, let's say, important information. The demand planner have, has to collect all of that information and use that uh, in order to build a consolidated plan. An APO is then a tool where everything comes together, but still a lot of planning is done in Excel. So on the, on the first bucket, we are currently as a company investing uh, into a TPM solution, trade promotion uh, management and optimization, replacing the Excel. And with that, we will have also in the future more structured data about promotions and qualitative information. What is the promo mechanism? Uh, what is the, uh, the duration of the promotion? And so on. Um, 
and in the let's say second uh, bucket um, we are uh, currently building our roadmap to move from apo to what we call next gen uh, planning capabilities a new platform cloud based uh, where all these uh, uh, possibilities uh, with big data analytics um, are, are possible and then further automation of, of planning and then on the right hand side that is where demand sensing com comes in so it's after the demand planner has basically received and reviewed all the input challenge that and create a, a consolidated demand plan then we feed that together with the open order shipments and all the different demand drivers which we can uh, find and which are relevant to our business into the uh, e2 open demand sensing engine and then to robert's point this runs then fully fully automatically every day every item and it's immediately released into supply planning so it's a touchless process and it breaks down our country forecast into an item week dc forecast on a, on a day-to-day uh, basis isn't that a bit uh, well scary to have it touchless that you don't you need to have some some alerts if there are outliers of some sort of yeah definitely and i think that is the beauty of the solution that it also comes with the option to activate it on the item level uh, so it's not that you turn it on and then every sku is being automatically forecast by the by the machine it is happening in the background which also enables you to compare it afterwards uh, but the demand planner can decide item by item uh, whether to use a machine learning forecast or not and of course we invested here into analytics to give a recommendation to the planner so that's one of the points i will come back uh, later on in the presentation on the change management piece that is of course important to have let's say a vision uh, also on how to drive that adoption that you make sure that you leverage the potential uh, but on the other hand side uh, deactivate it uh, there where it is not adding value uh, um, Robert uh, is uh, was referring to uh, COVID nineteen and what uh, what it uh, did for the supply chain and uh, demand planning. So uh, maybe we should talk about uh, Henkel what it do, did for you uh, as a company. Yeah, exactly because uh, indeed uh, COVID nineteen uh, came across our path in the, in the middle of the implementation uh, basically. Uh, so that has slowed us down a little bit. But on the other hand side, I think it has also generated very important insights which we can now leverage. Um, moving forward in, in into the further rollout and uh, i will show you in a minute a, a picture to to explain that but before we go uh, to that piece um, so that is the status today of our rollout we did a successful pilot end of 2018 and then we decided to um, roll that uh, out across the globe in three different phases and you see a little bit uh, the territories that we are covering. So phase one is about um, the main markets in Europe and US. Phase two, we uh, complete the rollout in Europe. And actually right now we are in the UAT phase and testing phase together with the colleagues in Russia, Turkey, APAC and Latin America to complete the global uh, rollout. In the implementation phase, did it uh, you know impact to implement uh, this and to, to, to continue the rollout or could yeah, the challenge the was correct the challenge was twofold so on the one hand side um th th that is of course a change which you uh, introduce in your in your planning landscape and yeah we are used to uh, make workshops and and, and training on site uh, so now we had to do that remotely and it's a quite technical topic so it's not so straightforward to do that via uh, zoom or team meetings but yeah we found here an approach also using some interactivity uh, with tools like mentimeter to let's say break a little bit uh, the longer duration of the meetings and, and and to get also the the connection with the audience so that was one challenge the other challenge is that in the countries which were live they have been disrupted uh, mm -hmm. and that is uh, basically what i will show now um, what has happened, what we have learned from that, and then especially what we decided um, in, in, in the further implementation uh, based on that, because it actually has shown a tremendous uh, potential. Yeah, before we get there, you know, you also have implemented Tableau as a, as a BI tool, a visualization tool. What I see in the market, you know, visualization also to explain to uh, executive what you're doing is very important. Don't you agree? Yeah, exactly. So we use Tableau uh, for two purposes. On the one hand side, indeed, to have a pulse check on um, how the 
demand sensing solution is running and, and whether that is in line with our targets and to very uh, be able to very quickly drill down and find the pain points. On the other hand side, we have also implemented uh, a real uh, recommendation, so more prescriptive analytics using the data from demand sensing and giving a feedback to the planners which items to put live and which to um, uh, put out of, the, of demand sensing because we don't see the improvement. Right. And with this, capture the full potential. Right. Uh, let's talk about demand sensing in the, the, the pandemic. Exactly. And I will use the, um, the graphic on, on, on the right hand side and I try to talk the audience through. So what you see basically is the, the, the forecast error. So the lower the, the line, the better, because that means you have a higher accuracy. And uh, there are three lines. The um, green one is the forecast error of the engine. The red one is a forecast error of the original demand plan provided by uh, the demand planning community. And the blue line is basically the forecast that goes live into our supply planning solution. So it's hybrid because either it's a green one if you take uh, the DS uh, uh, engine forecast, or it's the red one if you decide not to activate it for a specific item. So the name of the game is to be on, on the green line or below because that means that where demand sensing is not adding value, you keep your DP forecast and your overall forecast uh, error is, is reduced. Now, what happened? Uh, just before the rollout, we were, let's say, gaining traction, and you see that the blue line is uh, the forecast uh, going into uh, S&P. Uh, supply planning is close to the green, so we are almost achieving the, the, the potential that is theoretically there. And then the first wave hit us uh, back in March, and you see that the forecast error is, of course, increasing, but the business took the decision in, in that uh, hectic period to stay in control. And I think if you look back, that is, uh, of course, a human and a natural decision. You don't know what will happen. We saw all these uh, crazy uh, peaks uh, in, in different categories, and you want to prioritize uh, your, your, your demands towards customers, and therefore, uh, you don't give it to the machine, you stay uh, uh, on control uh, of what you send to supply for, for producing and reacting on the short term. But what we see, ex post, looking back, is that in that period, also the accuracy of the engine went down, so the green line is going up, but throughout the whole period, it has been outperforming DP. And that actually has generated a great insight because that shows that you can really leverage that capability on a large scale on your full portfolio and that it delivers value independent whether you are in let's say um, turbulent times or in normal uh, periods it is simply improving uh, your overall accuracy and that is basically when we took the decision to also um, formulate an ambition and our ambition is that 80 percent of our forecasted volume we want to uh, do through the AI um, forecast. So that is basically our ambition. There are always exceptions in the business. Uh, so therefore, uh, we want to keep some flexibility uh, for the planners to decide on um, bypassing the system. But the bulky uh, part of, of the business should go to the engine because we see that it delivers added value. When I uh, look at other companies who are depending only on, well, statistical forecasting, you know, some of them, and there was probably a smart move to put off uh, uh, the, the forecasting engine because statistical forecasting didn't work anymore. But, but, but in your case, you have next to your demand plan, demand sensing, and then it, it still makes sense. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So because you see that the, the error is indeed going up in that period, so it's harder, of course, in turbulent times to uh, uh, for, forecast accurately, but still using that capability of demand sensing on top and using the information which is available in open orders, which is current and not based on the history, you can uh, boost the quality of, of, of your total forecast. And one of the things I always say to the demand planning community is this, this machine never gets tired and it's also not prioritizing. It treats all your SKUs, also the, the, the big tail end, uh, which we often have, with the same priority as your number one SKU. And therefore, it, it's scalable. So demand planners can focus their attention on the, uh, let's say, uh, high volume items, which really matter to the business, and the rest can be dealt with by the engine. Uh, and you don't have to look at it because you know that it will uh, improve uh, your forecast. 
And if you dig deeper, what is the, the, the impact of uh, demand sensing? Well, uh, yeah, you've seen, let's say, the development of the forecast error. What I have shown here now on the left-hand side is our forecast accuracy measured in, in weekly buckets, and it's a snapshot taken four weeks in advance. You see in the in the middle of the graph that it goes down and that uh, also the heat map is getting reddish, so that was in the middle of COVID. Uh, but afterwards, you see a nice uh, recovery, and that is uh, supported by the decision to go towards this 80% volume ambition uh, of uh, putting items on demand sensing. And if you look back then uh, more of a longer period, then, then we see that pre-COVID in 2019, that accuracy for this uh, scope of the phase one countries was around 40. And today, post-COVID, using the S to the full extent, uh, we are at 50%. Our ambition is 60% and higher. But nevertheless, the 10 percentage point is a, is a significant improvement. Uh, yeah. On the right-hand side, even more important because an, a nice forecast is good, but at the end of the day, you do it to, to, to reach a better service in the market with lower inventories. And that is basically uh, what you see there is that in percentage ness, our inventories in 2020 have been lower. Uh, our ambition is far beyond that, but we also took a conscious business decision. Uh, it was our strategy to be able to react in the marketplace, to take market share if the competition was not able to deliver, and therefore we heavily invested in additional inventories uh, to be able to react fast in core categories where we can make the difference. Uh, so that is offsetting uh, the gains uh, we, we made uh, through demand sensing. So we believe that in normal times, um, that should lead to significant inventory reduction with same or higher service levels. Yeah, and especially in the, the, the pandemic, you don't want to have uh, stock out uh, to the retail. Exactly. Yeah, right. Uh, so what were your key learnings in this project last year? Yeah, many, many learnings. And uh, of course, not all is, is perfect. So it's a, it's a balanced picture. And we created that picture in the middle of the implementation of the first phase. And I did not change it. I just updated it on, on the right-hand side. Um, I will not touch on, on all the points, but let me call out a, a few Im important ones. So first of all, demand sensing is clearly perceived also by our demand planners now as an objective challenger. Uh, it creates a healthy competition. Planners want to beat the engine. So it also drives a changed behavior in demand planning. They are much more focused on uh, improving the accuracy also on the on the short term and in weekly buckets, while before it was more like a monthly uh, um, focus uh, with regards to, to, to business forecasting. Short term accuracy has improved. I think we have shown that uh, very important for supply planning, also the, the bias reduction. So all the additional safety, which is put in the forecast is to a great extent uh, taken out. We see a uh, positive impact on our forecast disaggregation in countries with multiple DCs. And then, of course, also our safety stocks uh, are one of the components where you gain, because if you reduce your error, you have dynamic safety stocks in place. This is one of the elements in the equation. It also brings us closer to the customer because we are now uh, using point of sales data, uh, not in all the countries, not with all the customers, but more and more. So that is, uh, I think, also uh, creating the, the, the right attention uh, on the customer. In terms of, of challenges, we, in the beginning, um, have been struggling a little bit to, let's say, put that piece into our overall planning landscape and to have also the stability in the interfaces. Uh, it's a daily process. It's touchless, fully automated, uh, but a lot of data is, is sent from the engine and back. And you need to get uh, all these timelines uh, right and also have, uh, let's say, built-in control mechanisms if something goes wrong. So that required some uh, learning curve, but we are there now. In initially, it's an additional workload for the planner. I, I don't think that this is the, let's say, end state. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the, the vision we have is that demand sensing is doing Uh, and they need to get familiar with that. The analytics piece here is very important. Uh, and we did not have that at the go live. So that was uh, an important learning for us, which we are now uh, benefiting from in, in, in the coming phases. Yeah. I can imagine that, that the activities of a demand planner is shifting. You know, uh, before uh, this implementation, 
doing a lot of manual uh, planning or adjust planning, whereas now with, with the uh, automated uh, uh, planning with demand sensing, yeah, he or she has more time doing uh, more uh, you know, uh, effort in looking at into the, the, the data, go, get, getting into uh, uh, the demand sensing engine. Right or not? Yeah. Um, maybe we talk about uh, change management and uh, the transformation part. So we get to the, the final part of your presentation, Jordan, and then we have uh, time for questions. Jordan? You're missing the connection. Jordan, can you hear me? Uh, Robert, maybe you can step in. What do you see as a as an expert on demand sensing? Uh, what what is, is necessary to to uh, make this work? Yeah, um, you know it. it oh, no, he's gone. Um, sorry about that. So. Uh, yeah, change management. You know, as much as it is, it does it does uh, create some fear in the demand planners that it might do something crazy and they're going to get blamed for it and they lose control over the forecast. So it's, it's sort of important to for leadership to talk to. You know, we're doing this for a business reason, right? Oh, yeah, I was connected somehow. Yeah. Oh, you you're back. Okay. Yeah, Robert was stepping in, but maybe uh, you uh, can uh, elaborate uh, about the lessons uh, learned uh, uh, on uh, change uh, management. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's very important to uh, focus on change management in, in such a program. Uh, that the technology piece is one thing. Uh, we have a lot of experience in that, but it's taking the people uh, along with you. And uh, we, we realize that um, often in a country, let's say in our situation, we have one or two demand planners and they are the face to the business. So in case the the market is not served they are in the front line eh? they are in the pressure of the local gm so we wanted to also make sure that they have and feel the support from the local management team and that's why we made a, a, a country roadshow so we went into the excoms of the the, the the countries in in the first phase to explain the project why we are doing that how we are creating value for the business and also how other functions in marketing and sales can contribute to the success and with this let's say get the full support locally for for the demand planners Secondly, and you touched upon that, uh, I think, earlier before the, the connection uh, broke, my turn, is that uh, on the right-hand side, we try to anticipate and address concerns. And what I realized um, in my visits into the countries is that the same questions are coming back all the time. Uh, so you, you just need to answer 10, 15 questions and to put them together in a document and to explain uh, that uh, to the people, I think, is important. And then uh, what I put here in bold, focus on the new opportunities. And there is uh, the, the, the role of the demand planner, from my point of view, is only getting more important. Uh, the demand sensing is a capability on top, which will help them on the short term uh, to further improve the accuracy and that time which, which is released by that, they can invest in other value-adding tasks uh, in the SNOP process engaging with the business. And I think that has to be part of the change story uh, when you roll out that, that piece. I was also wondering, you know, uh, regarding change, change management, how did you know that your planners were uh, up to this whole implementation, that they are ready and, you know, that the, if they would embrace it or not? I think, yeah, you, you can never, let's say, look in, in, into the head of people, but uh, talking helps and, and, and also creating a, a trustful atmosphere that, that uh, critical uh, voices can also and concerns can be can be uh, ventilated. Yeah, so that there are no, um, we always say um, early bad news is good news because from that you can you can learn and you can address that. Uh, and we might also uh, not see things on, on headquarter level. So that the knowledge in the markets is extremely important. They know their business very well and to engage them from the start in the project and to show them uh, how that will influence their, their life, I think is important. And, and, and especially to give them the reassurance that their role is not 
going away. Uh, we are not replacing the, the role of the demand planner. We are building a capability on top to boost our accuracy. And did, did you also appoint or uh, uh, find for local ambassadors for this whole project to, to make sure that they could also express what you have been telling about this whole project to roll it out? Yeah, so it, it depends a little bit on the setup. We have the, the bigger countries have, uh, have bigger demand planning teams, and then you have also local key users in the country. Uh, but besides that, we have um, regional end-to-end -end planners in our organization that make the connection between the local demand uh, planners and the central supply planning function. And they play a key role because they have, a let's say, in the region, a span of control which is manageable. They can go more into the details and also support them uh, in, in the implementation. And they are indeed serving as, as experts within the market, uh, spreading uh, the voice, uh, but also after the, the, the project implementation on the day-to-day, -day, they can support the countries a lot while the global team is then moving to the next phase. All right. Um, before we get to the, the Q&A, uh, could you... Uh Tell us about uh, the lessons learned on the change management uh, journey. Yeah, I think some of those we, we already touched. Um, of course, it's uh, uh, always the fear of the black box is there. Uh, so uh, are people trusting the, the result of the engine? And I think there are two uh, elements uh, which you can think about in a, in a strategy to, to mitigate it. First of all, important is that the top management is behind. Uh, and I think the fact that we have now clearly formulated that ambition that we want to drive up to 80% of our forecast with machine learning techniques is a clear signal towards the organization uh, where we want to go. And we are not discussing the uh, anymore that we are doing that. Uh, we are discussing on the concrete solutions that we need to bring in order to make that work uh, but the goal the vision is there secondly trust always comes with uh, showing the results and what we have uh, done here is that we um, during the uat we took the countries through the results of the historic modeling uh, because you train the, the algorithms based on past data and you can show them how this uh, the system reacted in in uh, in, in the past to specific events. So if we go now to our countries in phase three, we can actually show them what happened during the pandemic. And with this also generate trust. Finally, we are always uh, going live first with a parallel run. That means that the E2Open engine is generating a live forecast every day, but we are not yet feeding that into supply. And so planners have a transition period in which they can, uh, let's say, look at the results, compare that with their own forecast, and with this we drive uh, trust. Uh, second point is about let's say avoiding the easy opt out eh? because I mentioned this, uh, this 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 option that you can also deactivate uh, the item and the risk is that after the project implementation uh, and maybe also with changes in the organization uh, that gets uh, forgotten over over time and you end up with a much lower volume so I think to monitor that and to have a, a framework in place where you measure uh, the performance and also the not captured benefits. Uh, we are always comparing the pure engine forecast with what is released to supply planning. And as long as we are not better than the pure engine forecast, that means that there is still potential left. Uh, and, and then also to work on concrete action plans to, to get it implemented. Third point is about uh, where do you um, make the people accountable for? Uh, of course, planners, uh, from my point of view, cannot be responsible for what finally comes out of the engine because there is a part which they cannot control. So we are still measuring demand planners based on their inputs. So their demand forecast, which goes into the engine, is the, the leading KPI for them. And they have to focus on making the best possible plan with the information they have. And then uh, DS comes on top uh, to boost further the accuracy. And last but not least, um, yeah, you need also to think about uh, the type of, of planners that you need. I think that is in general with the technology uh, development uh, evolving a, a lot. And, and probably uh, the type of planners in the future, you will have different kind of capabilities in a team, the more technical experts that are able to uh, interpret data, build algorithms and um, do the analytics, but you also need uh, the people that uh, yeah, can have storytelling uh, capabilities and can engage with the business and explain something very complex in simple words. 
so that are basically, let's say, the key uh, learnings uh, from, from the change management piece. And there are, there are definitely many more. So we are also learning and improving uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. But that is something I, I wanted to share today. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, now we have uh, time for a QA. and a um, So we have five minutes left for uh, questions. So uh, feel free to ask your questions. You see the question mark in your uh, uh, panel, in your screen to the right. And you can also um, uh, uh, vote for questions. And after this five minutes, we have also 30 minutes, we can go into the lounge and you can uh, speak to uh, Robert, uh, Jordan, and me uh, directly uh, into uh, uh, in the lounge at the at tables. But first, um, 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 uh, one of the, you know, uh, the most favorite question is, could you elaborate uh, on the differences between demand planning versus sensing and how sensing complements planning. So maybe you can elaborate a bit more. Maybe it's to start with Jordan. So what does uh, demand sensing add to demand planning? Are and are they done by different people? Yeah, good question. Uh, I try to let's say answer that in the presentation, but maybe I have to let's say emphasize the, the key message here again, and that is that demand planning is still done by the people as before. It's an input into DS. And what we are currently doing with the demand sensing solution that we have built is two things. First of all, disaggregate the country forecast into a DC forecast. Uh, and on a more granular level, uh, because um, our people are planning in weekly buckets, we uh, break that down to daily buckets. And then the machine learning uh, uh, forecasting comes on top in order to, let's say, create the best possible forecast, not only considering the input from the demand planners, but also all these other leading indicators of demand which, which, which you have modeled. And that is then released directly into supply planning. And overall, it's a touchless process. So the yes is running automatically. Uh, it's a demand planner, uh, nevertheless, who decides which items uh, he puts live on, on, on the engine forecast and where he is basically making a legacy pass or keeping his own forecast. Uh, but besides that, there is not a lot of management uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's more project implementation to get that piece integrated into your overall uh, planning landscape. So it doesn't matter on which kind of level, product group or SKU you are planning, in demand planning versus demand sensing. The sensing itself happens at a DFU level, that is a demand forecasting unit, and you can, let's say, connect different uh, items uh, that are similar. So in our CPG business, it's the EN of the consumer unit, basically. We have different SKUs in case of label changes, but we uh, plan them together. Yeah. Uh, that is the level on which the engine is running. But yeah, maybe Robert can also elaborate on that. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can do that on any aggregation level. It depends on, on what is required for, for, for your business also in terms of the of the time buckets yeah there are, there are companies that plan in in half hour buckets for us that is not relevant we are still doing supply planning in weekly buckets we are thinking about moving on a short term to daily buckets and that would be facilitated by ds because we have already let's say a forecast for the for the next eight weeks in in daily buckets but today in snp we are consolidating that again Hey, there's also a question about the, the, well, the interaction between uh, SAP APO or possibly IBP to uh, this engine. So can you uh, elaborate uh, a bit more about that? Yeah, so today we don't have a, let's say, SNOP or IBP layer in, in our planning uh, landscape. So that is uh, done in a traditional way uh, using Excel and, and PowerPoint. But we are actually right now embarking in a, in a major transformation program. Uh, in the laundry division to move from SNOP to IBP. Uh, and then we will, let's say, also reevaluate our entire system landscape, moving from, from sub APO for demand and supply planning to one of the next gen uh, players can be sub IBP, but there are many others out there. So that is something that we will, uh, let's say, uh, evaluate in the coming uh, weeks and, and, and months. DS is definitely part uh, of that. Um, what we are doing right now with Edo Open is the short-term demand sensing. Uh, I would also like to explore the long-term demand sensing to, let's say, also use machine learning techniques uh, to build a forecast on the mid and long term. Um, I, there, there are a lot of uh, questions uh, coming in, so uh, I would, uh, you know, propose that you would uh, join us uh, in the lounge uh, after this because uh, we're already on the hour. Um, so, um, you know, uh, we can have uh, a further conversation in the lounge uh, the next 30 minutes. So you can go in, in the lounge after this. Um, 
So there's more stuff from E to Open. Uh, you know, Robert has explained a lot, but uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting white papers explaining a lot. And uh, you see here the links uh, of uh, all these uh, white papers. So, uh, you know, uh, when you get the PDF, there's also the link uh, to uh, these uh, white papers and more stuff. Um, before we uh, wrap up, uh, next week we have another webina webinar on, uh, on Wednesday. We'll talk about uh, connected planning for COVID-19 vaccine distribution, uh, totally different uh, product, but also related to supply chain planning, but a totally different way. And um, before we uh, go into the lounge, uh, Robert, uh, thank you for joining us and for explaining uh, what demand sensing is. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Having do, you, do you have a final remark for the audience before we go into the lounge? I would just say, I, you know, I think there's still an awful lot of companies that have not explored it. So, you know, go out there and give it a try. Look at who's using it. Look at the installed base. Okay. Better forecasts help everybody. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, Jordan, uh, thanks a lot for your uh, presentation. Well, what is real like within Henkel, uh, the, the, the laundry and home care business and demand sensing. Do you have a final recommendation for the audience before we go into the lunch? Yes, I think it's very exciting to, to be in planning. There is a lot of things happening. Uh, new technology is uh, breaking through. I think we are talking since many years about AI and ML, but it gets now more really into uh, concrete solutions. And for us, this is the start of a journey. And I can only recommend, uh, like Robert said, to, to get started and, and to leverage that capability because indeed a better forecast helps to better steer your business. Well, thanks a lot uh, to the audience. Thank you for uh, for watching and uh, participating, and thank you for all the questions. Um, you know, we go into the lounge, so uh, I will take a break, and you see uh, the, the orange button on top of your screen to the lounge, and you can uh, sit down uh, at a table. Uh, you know, you can talk to Robert uh, of E2 Open, to Jordan of Henkel, and you can talk to me. But also, you can uh, talk to each other. So, thanks a lot. Thank you for joining, and uh, hopefully, see you uh, next week at the webinar. Uh, and uh, maybe I will see you right away now in the lounge. So thanks a lot and see you in the lounge. Yeah.